I went as an exchange student to England and with a group of other American students. And we were in Oxford, and I was having a conversation at a party. We were having a party, and, uh, and maybe because the person I was talking to had had a glass of wine or something and was feeling a little more uh, uh, loose or whatever, but she was from New York City. And we were talking, and there was an English guy there named Peter who was part of the conversation. And so we were talking, she said, you know, your accent makes my skin crawl. And, and I've never had anybody say something like that to me, and it really uh, caught me up. I said, why? She said, because it's so racist. And I said, well, I know there's plenty of racist people out there, but I never heard of a racist accent. I mean, I, that's a value. <laughs> I, said, I said, what about your, you know, what, what about your accent? You know, what, how is it judged? And she said, I don't have an accent. She said this in her New York accent. <laughs> At which point, Peter, the English guy, just started laughing and then just told her off. <laughs> you, know, you do have an accent. So, um, you know, it's all subjective and we put value judgments on things. And we put, in, in, in the case of Appalachian accents, we've had a lot of value judgments put on it that are negative. If you talk like the, I'm talking, like right now, it's because I'm ignorant. You know, it doesn't matter if I've written novels and been published by a New York publisher. If I talk, you know, if I have an a Appalachian accent, that somehow makes me, you know. I, I tried to call a cab in Philadelphia one time. Uh, and, um, and this is back before cell phones, so I was at a pay phone. I'm trying to call this cab. And, and, and the, the woman on the other end said, what? Uh, and, I, I said, I'm trying, I, I need a cab at the corner of Cherry and something, whatever the street was. And she said, what? And I thought, you know, back in those days, those kinds of phones had bad connections sometimes, so I just thought that she couldn't hear me. I said, I, I need a cab at the corner of Cherry, and, and she said, don't yell at me. You're the one that can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> so. So th and those are all experiences that anybody from this region had when they got out of the region. Well, the same thing actually happens to your literature. You know, when I write a book set in West Virginia, I'm from West Virginia and write a book set in West Virginia, that gets called a regional piece of literature. Um, which is not, that's not a problem, except that if I write a book, if I'm from New York and I write a book set in New York City, that's not considered regional literature by mainstream publishers and by many critics and so forth. Well, in fact, it is. <laughs> the Catch from the Rye is just as much a regional work as Storm and Gavin is. Uh, it just is which region you're dealing with. So, uh, so that's the way I approach the question of regional literature. And, and now I think we are at a point where, thank goodness, um, when this book came out, uh, you know, and I'm Storm and Gavin, Denise Jardina was on there, Actually, even uh, you know, to have an Italian name on a book was, uh, was unusual. And uh, because if you looked at, at authors' names back in 19, the early 1980s and mid 1980s uh, and earlier, it was all English, anglicized sounding, you know, Smith and Jones and all that. And, and in fact, uh, I considered changing my last name uh, to my mother's maiden name. Um, just because it sounded more um, English. Uh, and uh, there was something about having an Italian name on your novel that um, I felt, and I think my publisher's maybe felt, you know, was not going to help sales, let's put it that way. Um, now, if you go to the bookstore and start looking at the fiction on the rack, you will see all kinds of ethnic names of different backgrounds <coughs> from all over the world. Uh, it's totally changed. And, and that's, and, the, and, and now we're reading books from all kinds of cultures, you know, from Africa to Asia, uh, to Europe, to South America, uh, that, that was not the case when I was young, and I really appreciate that, that change that has happened. And, and that includes Appalachian literature. Um, uh, so, um, so I really, uh, so, so I wanna talk about, um, maybe a little bit about how this book came into being, but I want to open it up for questions fairly soon too, because uh, hopefully some of you have read it and may have some questions about that. Um, 
uh, and also hopefully some of you, if you haven't, you know, would still have questions about the process or whatever that, that you might be interested in that, um, and I could stand up here and talk the whole period and I might not touch on what it is you want to hear. So, uh, so let me just talk about this. I, I grew up in a coal camp. I was born in Bluefield uh, at the Bluefield Sanitarium. Uh, it's not there anymore. Uh, I think it's now St. Luke's, is that what it is? Um, but it used to be called the Bluefield Sanitarium. It used to sit right here across the railroad tracks and down a little bit back towards the downtown area. Uh, it's a red brick building up on the hill. I was born there and I had my tonsils out there, so I've been there twice. I don't remember the first time. I do remember the tonsils but, uh, because of the ice cream you got after me. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, um, but I, I, was, I only spent a few days here, obviously, when I was, you know, the first two or three days of my life because I grew up in McDowell County. Of course, we lived on Gary Holler. How many of you are from McDowell County? I should say McDowell County. Well, that's good. Uh, so, so some of you know where Gary Harler is, and um, um, and uh, I grew up in a coal camp called Blackwood, uh, which is between, if you know McDowell County, is between Thorpe and Page, in that, that area. Um, and um, and I went to school at Thorpe, and I went to grade school the first year, uh, seventh grade at Gary Junior Senior High School. Um, so uh, that's my identity. Uh, and when I was, uh, after the seventh grade, uh, my father lost his job. Uh, you know, we lived in a coal camp. Um, my father, I had, uh, my grandfather was a coal miner, um, my Italian grandfather, and I had uncles who were coal miners uh, on both sides of the family. But my father was claustrophobic, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and he became a bookkeeper and he worked for a coal company. So he was not a miner, but we lived in the same house that the miners lived in, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, so I had that experience of growing up in a coal camp, which I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. Uh, but uh, it was also an eye opener in terms of the way miners were treated. Um, even my father um, was considered expendable, I guess you could say. When we uh, we lived in this little uh, four room camp house in Black Wolf, and then. Uh, when I was in seventh grade, they were starting to sell the houses to the miners. Uh, and uh, and the, the doctor in the next uh, camp of Pageton left, uh, and so his house was for sale. So my father, and it was a big house, uh, like eight rooms, and it was like, whoa. So, so he bought this house, the first house he'd ever owned, but which the company sold him. The company said, we want, you, we want you to buy a house, and so he bought this house. Two months later, literally, they fired him and they laid him off, like they were doing miners as well. So they sold the houses, and as soon as they strapped you with a house uh, and a mortgage, then they laid you off. Which my, my parents never talked about it much, but I, I was I was 12 year old furious, <laughs> and uh, and 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 also the fact that I was going to lose my home, and, and we ended up moving up. But I, I think that experience of growing up and then losing it at that age, there's something about the, you know, that age, 12, 12, 13, 14 years old, that's just when you're becoming an, you know, on the way to becoming an adult and, and um, you're um, just having all this upset in your life and all of a sudden you discover boys and you know, you're, you know, all this turmoil going on and then to, to be uprooted at that time is a very difficult time of life to be uprooted. And it, I think it burned into me this need to tell this story about the coal fields. Uh, and, um, but I didn't hear about the coal mine wars, and I, hope, I don't have time to really go into them much if you're not familiar with the coal. Those of you who haven't read the book, if you're not familiar with the mine wars, but um, there was a period of time before the coal industry came when we were a very self-sufficient people in this region. Uh, but then coal companies and land companies came in and bought the land wholesale. Magdalen County, um, I did some research uh, in the land books at the courthouse. Um, and in 18, 1870, if you look at the land records in 1870, um, you'll see a list of the landowners. It's all these people's names. <coughs> if you look at the, at the at, the land book for 1890, 20 years later, the list of the landowners are all companies. 
in this in a period of 20 years, the land shift, the land ownership decision shifted from individual people to companies, and that was a devastating thing that happened. And, and I, felt, I felt like it was a story that needed to be told because a lot of that land was gained illegally, uh, and um, had it happened to my family on my mom's side, and uh, uh, a lot of people, and, and probably. If, those of you who've had family in this region since the 1800s, you might have family stories about how land was lost. Even. Um, and my, my mom's family lost some land when uh, her great her grandfather was um, what they call a rounder, and he was uh, a gambler. He'd go to town, town and gamble and drink and stuff on Saturday nights, and he got ended up in jail. For, and in order to bail himself out of jail, he signed over the mineral rights for his land, and, and, the, and didn't, but didn't think, you know, what did that mean, you know, the mineral rights? And, well, what it meant was they lost the land, and a few years later, a company came in and said, this is our land now. Uh, and so a lot of families have stories like that. So I started out the book with uh, uh, that story of the land being lost, and then go into life in the coal camps back in those days, and then the effort to, jo to bring the union in, and, uh, and all the disruption that came from that and, um, and the hardship that people went through. You know, um, I, I never heard anything about this when I was a kid because it was never taught in school. Um, but I discovered a book uh, when, I was just, when I was in college. Uh, I was home uh, for, from uh, college and I went in a local bookstore in Charleston and um, I found this book called Bloodletting in Appalachia. They had a little section of Appalachia books. And it said, Bloodletting in Appalachia. And I thought, what? Was that about vampires or what? <laughs> Is that, uh, and so I, I looked, started looking through it, and there were these pictures of, of people living in tents uh, and pictures of machine guns and, uh, on the, uh, at company stores. And, and it was written by a man named Howard B. Lee, who was the Attorney General of West Virginia at the time all this stuff was going on. And it was interesting because Mr. Lee was actually, he didn't like either side. He didn't like the coal miners and he didn't like the coal mine operators. So, so he didn't have, and in that sense, he wasn't like trying to, to take one side or the other and say, oh, this side's good and that side's bad. He was just kind of showing both sides and he was kind of cranky. So he just kind of was cranky about the whole thing. But, but because of that, it was kind of interesting to see uh, and, uh, and, and to realize that he was actually laying the, the actual events out there pretty good. And to realize that people had been kicked out of their houses and were living in tents. It, that, you see what the weather's like out here like today? Imagine that you're living in a tent with your little kids and you're living out there in this weather for all the winter months and, you, and then <coughs> for a whole year. Imagine what that was like. And, and that's what people went through in order to try to better themselves uh, in order to be able to join the union. And I was like appalled. I was reading this, and here I am a college student reading this, and I, I, nobody ever told me about this. Nobody told me that 10,000 coal miners finally had had so much, they were so fed up with that kind of treatment that they, that they armed themselves and marched, they were marching from Charleston down toward Logan County uh, because they were, the sheriff of Logan County was a really pro coal guy who used to take people out and shoot them uh, just for whatever, just for the, for the fun of it. Uh, and so they were marching down there to overthrow him uh, and they were gonna hang him and then they were gonna march on Domingo County and establish the union as they went. And I, I was like, and like, I'm like, nobody ever told me about this. <laughs> yeah, so I decided I was going to write about it. Uh, and, and, uh, and it turns out that at the same time that I was planning on writing about it, John Sales was, had in mind to make a movie about it. And I don't know, how many of you have seen the movie Made One? Anybody seen it? Okay, a few. If you have not seen it, rent it and watch it. Uh, it's an amazing movie that's about the coal mine wars. Uh, it's, it's about the same thing I'm writing about here, which is how Appalachian people and African Americans who came in to work in the coal mines 
and Italian Americans who came in to work in the coal mines and all kinds of ethnic groups who came in to work in the coal mines. After initially not getting along, realized that they actually were all in it together and joined together and, and pushed to bring the union in and, and pushed to better their lives. Uh, and, um, and, you know, the reason that miners today, whether they're union or non-union, the reason that they're paid decently is because of what people went through back then. Um, so um, I decided to tell that story. Well, it was a big story to tell, and I had some decisions to make um, about the writing um, and, and um, two problems. Um, and I really owe uh, solving them to William Faulkner, uh, uh, a great American writer from the South. Um, and um, the, the first problem I realized I was having was that I was trying to figure out, got the, I created some characters in my mind, and I'm like, how do I get them to all the places where these events happen? Because I wanted, I wanted to start in MacDowell County, and so I created a town, uh, well, I, I, I was basically focused on the town of Keystone. Uh, Keystone is an incredible place. Um, I, I, one of the books that I used uh, for research uh, I listed the books I used in the beginning of the book, um, uh, and one of them is um, called um, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah for Today, uh, a history of Keystone, West Virginia. Well, well, and it was for, uh, it's a book I found in the Cultural Center up in Charleston in the archives, uh, and you could still go read it. It's really small, so if you had an afternoon sometime and wanted to go take an hour and read it, you could read it in half an hour. You can look at it. It's just this little pamphlet written by a Virginia lad anonymously in 1905 who was extremely racist. And apparently, he came to Keystone and was shocked by what he shocked, shocked by what he saw. Uh, because what he found in Keystone <coughs> was a, a town of, of, of ethnic and racial Im, uh, integration where this is at the period of time. In, in America when you had Jim Crow, uh, which means that accommodations were segregated uh, and restaurants were segregated and, and uh, public transportation was segregated. And that was true not only in the Deep South, that was true in New York City even. Uh, you know, if, you were in New York, if you're an African American in New York City, you couldn't go in a restaurant unless it was in Harlem. You, know, you couldn't go, you know, farther south in Manhattan to Midtown or downtown and, and eat in a restaurant. Uh, and segregation was all over the place, except in Keystone, West Virginia, where which, to, which was totally integrated. The only thing that was segregated was the schools. The schools were still segregated there because it was a countywide school system. But, but in Keystone, the town council was uh, well, the, this Virginia lad who was prejudiced, like, like racist. Okay, this is the way he described it. He said there were there were five people on the town council in Keystone. There were there were well, two Negroes. He, he called them as if he called them a worse name. I'm not sure what I'm using. But one Jew and two white men. <laughs> That's the way he described it. Uh, but but think about it. There, it's an integrated town council. Uh, I, he said that um, sometimes the mayor was a white man, sometimes it was a black man. Uh, the, the Keystone was famous for its whorehouses, <laughs> to put it bluntly, um, and cinder bottom. Um, but they were integrated. The, the police force was integrated, and, and that's one of the things this Virginia lad, um, of course, he apparently, he clearly had done his research in the whorehouses <laughs> because he described how they were, how integrated they were. Uh, but he clearly had been in one. Uh, but um, he was appalled and outraged that the police force was in, was seven, was integrated. And he, he he said, "We've got to get the Klan to come here and clean up this police force uh, because it, it should be all white." You know? And um, and he was appalled that, you, that when you got on the train, you had to sit next to to an African American. Uh, he was appalled at the integration he found there, and and it's like. So when you realize this is how racist this guy is, but he's he's obviously not trying to sugarcoat anything. You know, if, if he had some good liberal person go in and say, oh, this is a wonderful place that's integrated, you might say, well, he's 
you know, tried to make it sound better than it is. But when, when, when you've got this great, or the racist guy coming in and, and saying this is the way that you like, yeah, it was, which I think it's good, obviously. We, I, I hope we all think it was a good thing. Um, and, and, but it was clearly, that's true. You know, he really captured the fact that this was an interesting anomaly town. Although it was also, I found that in doing further research, there were a number of places in Southern West Virginia that were like that. Uh, and in fact, Southern West Virginia was probably the most advanced place in the country at that time in terms of, of, of racial uh, integration. Uh, there were, for example, there were in, in, in McNeil County, there were uh, doctors, African American doctors, lawyers, first African-American in the legislature was, was a woman, African-American woman, way back in the 1920s. Um, there were coal companies that were owned by African-Americans. Um, so, so, th so this was really a melting pot. And then, of course, I come from the, the Italian heritage, uh, and, um, and it was a place where, you know, when I was growing up in McDowell County, um, there, there were, you know, probably in the North Fork area, you know, half the population was Italian, and that's where my dad was from. And um, and on Gary Holler, uh, where I lived, there were all, you know a lot of Czechoslovakians and um, Poles, uh, and uh, it was just a real melting pot. So um, so I wanted to capture that. Um, but um, the problem was, like, I had to create these characters, and then how do I get them from McDowell County uh, to Cabin Creek, which is where a major strike took place, uh, and uh, and then how do I get uh, my character? I've got a character who's living in Pike County, Kentucky. How do I get her over to West Virginia? And how do I uh, take events that happened in Lovely County and, and and bring them in? And I began to realize that that it would be so much easier if I could just squish it all together, like take Southern West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky and squish them into one little area. Uh, and, uh, and I realized that William Faulkner had done that. Uh, William Faulkner created a fictional county in Mississippi called Yachtnabatapa County. And so he said everything there. And I thought, why can't I create a fictional county in West Virginia uh, and a fictional county in Kentucky and have everything, everything that happens, so whether it was Mingo County or, or uh, Magdow County or Kanawha County, or or up, you know, in you know Monongah, uh, uh, in, up near Fairmont, uh, and squish it all together in one county. So I created Justice County, West Virginia. I picked a name out because there's a town in Magdow County called Justice, but it, it's over. Uh, it's not really a town, but it's a, uh, it's like a little, <laughs> little wide place yeah. in the road. Huh? But it's over near the Mingo County border, and and so I kind of I, and. Um, I also like the name Justice because I had this, you know, I had this line front running through my mind, which is that there ain't no justice in Justice County, which I thought was too corny to use in the book. But, um, but <laughs> so I picked Justice, Justice County, and uh, and I started picking fictional names for the towns, and, and uh, so I had all these events happening there uh, in this fictional county. And I really owe that to Faulkner. I also began to realize as I was writing the book, I, I wrote. Um, I took a year and I was writing in third person and it was very uh, distant. It was kind of a very distant third person. Uh, uh, and uh, the third person point of view is when you have sort of an omniscient narrator who's kind of, it's like God looking down on the world and saying this happened. And, and, um, and it wasn't working. I, it was, I just didn't feel it was getting close to um, the minors and, and the, the really the emotion of the minors. And um, so I decided to switch it over to first person. Uh, and this, by the way, as far as writing goes, just to let you know, this this is what goes into writing a novel. You don't just sit down and, you know, there's this thing now called write a novel in a month. The thing is just, they just have, they just had, like, I think again, this year, last month was write a novel month. Or something. <coughs> you don't write a novel in a month. <laughs> you might write a novel proposal in a month, but you don't, but it takes years to write a novel. Uh, and so I spent, I spent a year and I probably, as far as the story goes, um, I got about as far as this. You know, I didn't even have this <coughs> yet, and I had 500 pages. And I thought this is a thing is going to be like long, like War and Peace twice over. You know, so uh, it wasn't working. And uh, but 
But I decided to switch it over into first person, which is where you know one character tells the story. But I, there was no character who could tell the whole story. It just was too complicated of a story. But Faulkner came to the rescue again. Faulkner, when Faulkner wrote a novel called As I Lay Dying, where he had multiple narrators. And he was one of the first to do that, maybe the first to do that. And, and, and so, I, so I realized that I to try to do that too. Um, so that's what I did. And I went back and started over and, and found that it, it started working. And so that, that's basically how Storming Heaven came to be over time. I'm, I'm going to stop here and, and because I have been rambling on. Let me check the time, see what, what time is it. Does anybody have a clock? Or? I think it's uh, 7 o'clock. 10 o'clock. 10.45. <coughs> 10 o'clock. Okay, so we've got 45 minutes. Okay. So let me stop here and see if there are questions. Uh, and, and then I can also maybe I can think of some other things to talk about too. That, any questions? Anything at all? Where did you do most of your research at before Stormy Hammond? Okay. Well, first of all, um, because I grew up in a coal camp, if I'd been from somewhere else, uh, I would have had to do a lot of research about what it was like to live in a coal camp. I didn't have to do that because I lived there. So, uh, so in that sense, that spared me some of that research. But, um, uh, but I still um, had to do a lot of research into the history of the time period uh, because uh, it wasn't taught in schools back then. I don't know, you know, there was a period of time after Storming Heaven came out and Mate One came out and, and uh, West Virginia Public Television started putting out some documentaries about the mine wars. And so there started being some interest in teaching it in the schools too. And so I think it did start in the 1980s and 90s to be taught more. I don't know if that's changed again or not, though. And I think probably it depends on the school. Uh, but probably some schools still don't teach it like they should. But, um, but uh, because I didn't have that, yeah, I even majored. I took a, I majored in history at West Virginia Wesley, and I took a class in West Virginia history. The mine wars were never mentioned in a college class, uh, which is absolutely ridiculous. But so I had to do that research um, and. When I found that book, um, Bloodletting in Appalachia, is when I realized I was going to have to do that. So I basically started, this is back before Amazon, so uh, so I basically went to a couple of different bookstores and they would have little West Virginia sections, but don't know what, and I started looking to see what they had. So I found several books there that had some history uh, background. And, and then the 80s, again, because of the renewed interest in it, uh, uh, People were starting to publish nonfiction books, so there were several excellent nonfiction books about coal mining, uh, and um, uh, there were books about, uh, also specifically about the African American experience that I read, uh, and um, I, st I did some research, I and mean, I read everything I could get my hands on as far as Appalachian culture is concerned, and music. And I started listening to old time mountain music, um, um, but, but hardcore research was done at the cultural center. Uh, and they have, in addition to that book I mentioned, they have an, another of other things in the archives. And then, the, but the best thing of all uh, was um, the Library of Congress had a three volume set of transcripts of hearings <coughs> that took place. The, the, after the mine wars, when they started happening, this was national news. Uh, the fact that 10,000 miners are taking up arms and marching to overthrow the local government, and that the U.S. Army came in <laughs> to stop that um, was national news. It was the front page of the New York Times. I looked at, I did I read a lot of old newspapers on microfilm into the cultural center, and about putting my eyes out doing it. Uh, uh, but um, the, this was, you know, you, you call up the New York Times for for uh, August, you know, whatever. Uh, late August uh, 1921, when the miners were marching. And there it is on the front page, top of the front page, armed rebellion, federal troops going in, all that. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, so it was getting attention back then. And, and so because of that, scholars were starting to notice. So back in the, at the time when I was researching this, there were also books starting to come out then about that time period. So I read, read all those. but. Um, uh, um, because it was a national sensation, 
the U.S. Senate decided to, they better hold some hearings on. So they actually sent the, a U.S. Committee, Senate committee came to Charleston and held hearings over a period of several days. Uh, and there were transcripts taken, just like it was a courtroom. You know, they had, had a stenographer there and then, um, and they interviewed everybody. I mean, they interviewed the governor, they interviewed uh, the local sheriffs, they interviewed the coal company officials, they interviewed a number of miners, they interviewed ministers, they interviewed anybody who could have, they interviewed Sid Hatfield, who if you know any of the, the mine history, he's the guy uh, that led the Mate One massacre and then was shot down on the courthouse steps in, in, in Welsh. Um, they interviewed him right before he got murdered. Uh, they interviewed everybody that was in, they interviewed the, the union officials who were behind the, the, the miners' march. Um, and so there it was, three volumes this thick, uh, the Library of Congress has, and I was able to get them because uh, I had worked on Bob Wise's uh, congressional campaign, he had just won, and so his office man managed to let me borrow them, borrow them for like six months, and, um, and I went through them. A and it was amazing because these people are talking in their own words. You know, you had a situation where you had miners living in these tents on Cabin Creek, or rather Paint Creek, and the lo local coal operator, Quinn Morton in Charleston, West Virginia, whose grandson got to be a friend of mine, but, um, but the local coal operator got a train, which he made, it, he made an armored car. He armored this whole car and put a machine gun on it. And he and the local, and the county, the Kanawha County Sheriff, and a bunch of other people got on this train one night and rode up to Paint Creek and rode up past one of the tent colonies and started firing at it with a machine gun. And now, and this is, and all these people testified. He testified, and the county sheriff testified, uh, and, and a local guard that was with them testified, and they, they testified, and this one guy's like, Mr. Morton said, we, we went past him, and Mr. Morton said, let's back up, boys, and give him another round. And <laughs> that was right there in this testimony. People were testifying under oath and stuff like this. And then Quinn Morton, says, I don't care, I, you know, I, you know, because this, this senator said, you know, sir, that was a terrible thing to do. And he's like, why? Yeah, you know, I don't care. It was fine. And I was like, what? <laughs> and you're reading this and you're thinking, uh, but it was, it was like reading a novel or something, reading, but I mean, because it's in people's words and that was the most important. Uh, I tried to, everything in here is, is based on something that was from a source like that. Uh, I mean, it's really, uh, I did not make stuff up. Um, the only major event here that uh, that was not from a written source was the scene where um, the, uh, an African-American uh, union organizer named Johnson comes in uh, and, um, and is thrown into a furnace. Because he's caught uh, and is thrown into a furnace which is the kind of stuff that, that uh, Don Chapin, who was the sheriff of Logan County at the time, that's the kind of thing he was accused of doing. Uh, and, um, and that's not written down anywhere, but I met a man, uh, this is an amazing story of, of itself. I was working for Bob Wise, uh, at, and we did this thing called a mobile office where you go out and people can come to the, meet the congressman and say, um, I've got this problem with Social Security or whatever it is. and and um, uh, so uh, I was working that, and I was actually had taking a break. I was sitting on a bench at St. Albans Mall, in St. Albans, West Virginia, and and I was sitting next to this elderly man, and we struck up a conversation, and and he said something about being a coal miner from Logan County, and I said, well, I'm working on this book, um, you know, I'm doing this research, and he said, oh, honey, I can tell you some stories, and, and he said. He said, there was a, one, of our, one of the miners, he said, when I was a teenager, this, this miner, uh, uh, this is a black miner, and they, they caught him with a union card on him, uh, and they threw him in a furnace. And I was like, <laughs> uh, and, and, and later I met an African-American uh, mine, uh, mine official um, who, who told me, he said, yeah, I heard that story too. Um, so, um, so that one, I don't have any written, 
in the corroboration of it, anything else in this, there's, there's, I've lost it now, but I, at, at that time when I had my notes with me, I could have pointed to any to say this was in the New York Times, such and such a time, this was in the Charleston Gazette, such and such a time. Um, there was a story I read in the Charleston Gazette where uh, the reporter said that uh, during the strike on Cabin Creek, that a traveling salesman was um, going, was on the train. This is back when people rode trains. It's the main transportation. Most people didn't have cars. And so this train is crowded. Uh, and there was a, a, one, a woman who got on, uh, and there was no place to sit. So the traveling salesman offered her his seat. So she sat down, um, and there was a mine guard on the train because this is the the mine guards were used like the Gestapo, basically. They, they were private police who could do anything they wanted to. They, they were in strike zone, so they were, they were policing all the trains. So the mine guard told the guy to sit back down. And he said, you know, she, she needs a seat. She's tired because she, uh, she was a minor wife. And, um, and the, the mine guard shot the salesman. And at the next stop on Cabin Creek, they took his body off. And, that, and I looked in the Gazette, and that happened. I mean, I read this in a book first in, in oral history, and so I looked in the, you know, on that date in the Gazette. That happened. Um, there was a, um, a, a guy who was going to Logan County from Charleston, a guy from Charleston who was going to Logan County to organize a chapter of the Knights of Pythias, which was a, it's like the Lions Club or the Rotary Club. I, I don't think it exists anymore, but, but Back in the, uh, that time period, in 1912, uh, it was a, it was a, just a popular civic organization. So he was going down there to or well, apparently he was talking to somebody on the train about organizing something, and the mine guard overheard him and thought he was talking about the new union organizer. So they took him off the train and beat him up and put him back on the train and sent him back to Charleston. And, and he was like, uh, "Gee, <laughs> what did I do?" <laughs> So, I mean, that kind of thing, and, and so, but it's, you know, it was all reported on and so forth. So, um, uh, I was able to do research that way. Um, it's a long answer, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Did you interview anybody from the UMWA? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, over the years, <coughs> in fact, I mean, I was involved with the UMWA also. Uh, at the same time that I was doing the research, um, Storming Heavens, yes, it came out in 87, so I started writing, I started researching it in 82, yeah, so um, the Massey strike was going on at the same time. Uh, there was a big strike against against Massey, this is back when Don Blankenship first became the president of Massey, uh, and, um, and I was, in addition to doing research, I was doing uh, freelance journalism uh, about the Massey strike, uh, and I met some UMW, I, mean, I knew some people in the UMWA, partly uh, also just living in Charleston and being involved in activist circles and so forth, you know, I knew some of the <coughs> organizers and so forth, but, uh, uh, so I didn't even have to necessarily interview them you know, in a formal kind of way, but, uh, but I went down to, and covered the Massey strike, and I remember being outside a um, uh, strike area at uh, Rawl, in, in Mingo County, um, and that's where they had um, inside the, the. We were outside. Uh, with, I was outside, you know, with where the pickets were, uh, and um, and they had um, barbed wire. What's that wire that you know that shaped like a hoop kind of? And they had that all strung along the top, and inside they <coughs> you could see this. It looked like a tank. That's what it was. And as what they used, they they would use it to transfer strike breakers. Um, uh, which were called scabs on the pickle, basically. But they would they would they would use that to bring them from another location and bring them into the mine. Uh, and um, and there was also the place where Don Blankenship famously uh, talked about um, his television set had been shot up because there was a TV in his office, I guess. And at some point, somebody had shot into his office and hit his TV. Uh, so. So it was an interesting, interesting experience, to say the least. But um, uh, but it was kind of a mob.